When my brother and I were younger, we used to love to jump off of our top bunk and land on a side bed. It was the most exciting thing to free fall the entire five feet and land on the soft cushion of the side bed. It was great until one day, my foot hooked onto the bunk bed ladder and I fell straight down onto my head, onto a Lego brick and onto that foam carpeting stuff that kids are supposed to be able to fall onto. A concussion, a bad one. But what exactly is a concussion? And why did I get one? A concussion is the most common type of traumatic brain injury that alters the way your brain functions. The impact of whatever is causing your concussion forces your brain to twist and strike against the insides of your skull, damaging your brain's soft jelliness. But I'm not alone in this injury. I mean, maybe most head injuries don't happen flying pirate ninja style, but however they happen, every 21 seconds, someone in the U.S. sustains a traumatic brain injury. And in 2014, TBI has killed almost 57,000 people in the U.S. The leading cause, which accounts for almost half of all TBI hospital visits, is falls. Next is being struck by or against an object, which accounts for 17% of the total, but up to 28% in children. This often happens during sports where a kid might, for example, get hit in the head with a ball or get tackled in football. The majority of football helmet liners are expanded polypropylene, which is basically just a more complicated version of styrofoam. While this can take on a large amount of impact, over time it degrades and loses its spring back. In addition, when teams travel and bring their equipment to different temperatures and altitudes, the foam's performance changes, for example, getting harder in the cold. Finally, research has shown that angular impacts are actually more damaging to the brain than linear impacts, because not only does your brain get um, hit against the insides of your skull, but also twists like a double whammy. There's no football helmet out there though that can absorb this rotational energy. With my focus being in biomimetics, I naturally looked to nature for a solution to see what other species were doing to protect themselves. After doing some research, I came across an unlikely suspect, hedgehogs. Hedgehogs can climb up to 30 feet in search of food. That's almost 10 meters. While they're up there, they're very vulnerable to predators like birds of prey. But to escape them, they could just jump off. So somehow, while well, I got a concussion at five feet, they're perfectly safe at 30 feet. Wild hedgehogs literally take falls all the time, which really spiked my interest to try and figure out why. The first thing I noticed was that when a hedgehog falls, its spines bounce off of each other and start a kind of domino effect throughout its entire pelt. This is probably the most obvious difference between a hedgehog's back and a piece of foam. The hedgehog's overlapping spines allow it to reduce acceleration and distribute a grand impact force over a large surface area, or at least as large as a hedgehog is. The spines also aren't sticking out perpendicularly because that would mean um, that they would break on impact and not be able to knock into each other. They're situated at a nice angle, around 60 degrees. But that's not all, because while porcupines focus their spine structure efforts into making their spines good at jabbing predators and making kebabs, hedgehogs made theirs able to absorb shock again and again without degrading. So the spine structure is what allows them to bounce back and the spine arrangement is what lets them distribute the force. Underneath their solid outer layer, they have 22 stringers running up and down with lateral plates that intersect them. The lateral plates branch off into three separate plates before connecting with the outer wall. If you look at a cross section, it looks kind of like a flower. And it's so mesmerizing to see how a hedgehog is able to grow such an intricate structure completely from scratch. What makes foam able to absorb impact and what makes it so light is its air pockets. But if you look at an x-ray of a spine, it has the same thing. Where the stringers and the plates cross, air pockets are formed, allowing it to bend under pressure. But because keratin is so strong, it doesn't break like many foams would. Their special structure allows them to resist buckling under their axial load, which is applying pressure to the tip, three times better than a hollow tube would. They're also ounce for ounce stronger than 201 stainless steel rods of the same diameter, and as pliable as styrene rods with just a slightly larger diameter. 
After teaching myself to use SolidWorks with a little help from YouTube, I made a model of a hedgehog spine that is pretty close to what they actually look like. Since there weren't exactly any tutorials on YouTube similar in shape to hedgehog spine, I kind of had to figure things out for myself after watching a couple of basic videos. But I figured it out and I actually made my own tutorial for anybody if they're interested in making their own hedgehog spine. The model has the 22 stringers and then also the lateral plates and the plates branch off into three separate sections on all around. So pretty close to an actual spine. After modeling it, I 3D printed it. I wasn't able to print it in the exact dimensions of a hedgehog spine because those are really small. Um, and if I did it, did print it so small, I wouldn't be able to get the internal structure. So I scaled it up quite a bit, but since it was so big, it wasn't able to, it didn't have the same flexibility of an actual spine. It was still cool to have a model though. If we were to manufacture this on a large scale, we would need to simplify the design a lot. I talked to the CEO, Emily, of a startup making a hedgehog inspired football helmet liner. And she told me that while developing the liner, they had run into this, some of the same issues that I had while printing my model. 3D printing isn't practical on such a large commercial scale. And if you were to injection mold it, you wouldn't be able to take it out of the mold. Luckily though, not every part of a spine is specifically designed for impact protection because spines also serve other purposes. So Hegemon, the startup, was able to simplify the design without compromising on the remarkable performance. There could be so many more applications than just helmets though. The estimated market for hedgehog liner impact protection technology exceeds $10 billion. Take packaging, for example. We all know how bad styrofoam packaging is for the environment and how hard it is to clean up when it crumbles on you. But what if we could just build it into the box? What about better barriers for NASCAR racing? Simply by replacing the foam used in their barriers, we could reduce both fan and racer injuries. Finally, falls hurt for everyone, but they're especially dangerous for seniors, with an older adult dying from a fall every 19 minutes. And these are seniors. It's not like they're going on some crazy adventure. If we were to add a layer of hedgehog material underneath pre-existing flooring, we could make it, we could convert it into fall protection flooring without needing it to look any different. I'm not saying that if my bedroom flooring had had hedgehog material underneath, I wouldn't have gotten hurt. I mean, I'm sure it would have been painful, but I might not have had to have been rushed off to the emergency room like I did. With this, I'd like you to just imagine. We could put the spine strategy on literally anything that needs protection for impact, whether that be humans or materials. The possibilities are truly endless. When we think about the future of impact protection, it's usually just adding more and more and more material, but things don't need to be that way. Sometimes the best innovations come in small, spiky packages. Thank you.